Welcome to the One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sallenberger. Today, I talk with Mylena Worsham about belonging. Hey, everyone. Thought I would just do a little check-in. It's been a pretty rough week at our house as COVID has come super close. None of us have COVID, but it's been pretty scary and pretty stressful. And I know that I am not alone in feeling this. I've been joking that I've been pretty Pollyanna for the past couple of months. And I feel like this week the rug has been ripped out from under my feet. And I've had a really hard time catching up. The other thing I've been joking about is my nervous system has felt completely jacked up. All my parts are so activated and uh, it's been really hard to just drop back down. So it's felt really nice to work on the podcast and even just working on this introduction uh, just felt really nice. So I'm taking a deep breath. I'm really glad to be with you all. I'm so thankful for the for the honor of doing this podcast and for this community. Today's episode with Mylena is so powerful. I felt like immediately this feeling and the sensation of really leaning in close as she spoke, and we just immediately jumped into her story. We later talked, and she said, everything I've been through in my life has led me to IFS. So that's my hope for you. I hope you have the sensation of leaning in close and just being with her and with us um, as you hear her story. The first half is her and her family's story. And the second half is her story around uh, performing arts and feminism. And it's just so intriguing. Ultimately, I think that her story and I think this episode is about belonging I hope you're doing well. I would love to hear from you at the One Inside Facebook page or at IFS Tammy on Instagram or Twitter. Mylena would also love to hear from you. You can email her or contact her through her website. Both of those things are on the show notes. This will be a super interesting week for our country. Interesting, I think is a interesting word to choose. But what I hope for you right now as you're listening in and for the rest of the week is that you feel a deep sense of belonging and a leaning in close to all of your parts who are fearful, anxious, worried, concerned, that they'll feel you leaning in and being close. Enjoy. Good morning. morning. Tell me about how old your baby is. So my baby is, well, she was one on August 17th. Oh my She's goodness. Just, mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, she is, sorry, I'm just in the, I'm in love with my baby. This is my second one. And I didn't realize how freaked out I was the first one. I mean, not only was I freaked out, my, I was going through a major life trauma on top of the birth. So it kind of like, and I knew it. But now I know it so much because it's the comparison. Like I I realized how I was in a state of trauma for probably the first two years of my son's life. Yeah, probably the big, one of the biggest traumas of my life, really. And so I, um, I'm getting emotional, but it, you know, I, I've been, I've, you know, I've had a few major life trauma, traumatic events, but this one, my, my son was when my son was born, he was born in hospice with my mother who was dying. And it was a sudden thing. Like she got sick right before he was born. And we didn't know how serious that was. I mean, she had had cancer for many years, but she was in remission for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden she developed this weird, uh, this cancer that was in the spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. And, but it happened like literally right as I went into labor. Oh my gosh. So then, yeah. So then she, and this is the first grandchild. So then he comes and we're going into hospice care and I'm her primary caregiver and his primary caregiver. And also in 
my, my husband and I, we were like in a new relationship. We weren't even married. We were in a new relationship. This was like, a, you know, not very long. And so that all happened. And when then we were in hospice care for the first three months of my dad, my, my son's life, me, my mother became paraplegic. Like, or, and so we had to like, I had to, and I was the primary caregiver. So luckily my husband, my partner at the time moved in to hospice. We all moved into hospice care together. And he primarily took care of my son between breastfeeding and me being with my mother full time. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was a lot. And it, it was, and there was more than that. It was a lot of trauma with my family and like my father and there's so much happened. And then that was residual after she died that, that there was like strife in my family for almost two years. And it took me a long time to like, actually realized that I was like almost in a state of like, like a, you know, like a, what do you call it? Like a limbo, which is like that trauma puts you in that. I got in the, the freeze, maybe disassociative freeze kind of mm, thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ash, that's, so my point of all this is that when, she, when Sahara came, who's my baby, I was like, oh, oh, I mean, I didn't get this the first time. So how many years between your kids? My son, okay. son is seven. Mm-hmm. What's his name? His name is Kinich. It's been really amazing. And at the same time, sad. Okay. That's what I was going to say. So is it, how is it for you to realize that, that, yeah. yeah. I'll be honest, like, uh, but at the same time, it's this weird thing. It's almost like he, he's been able to experience Sahara because he's in, in it with me, you know, yeah. and, and there's almost a mo I see it with him. Like he, I feel like there's a, a discernment in him that he realizes some of this. And so there's a lot of re not that I can go back, but there's definitely a lot of like him wanting to come in and be more like a baby again. And so us like going, okay, this is fine. Like we're, we can do that. We can go and redo some of that stuff with you and the baby at the same time. Mm-hmm. And, um, also, you know, there was a thing that he got that Sahara isn't getting. So because he was born in hospice and I was very busy and I was in a trauma, but I had, there was a community there. Oh yeah. Yeah. So he was born into community. So mm-hmm. like all my mother's family and all her friends and all my direct family. So he was like, had all these people that were just like holding him and loving him, even though I wasn't there. Yeah. And yeah. so because of that. Um, he became, he's a very easy baby. Like he was like anybody, he's like, give me attention. I'm with you. Like, where's my Sahara? She's like, uh, 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 where's my mother? Like, who are y'all? Mm-hmm. I want my mommy. Yeah. <laughs> I want my mommy. Very different. He's a, and he still is that way. He's like, what's next? Who's going to come over? Can you call mm-hmm. this, you know, can you call this person to come over? Can we go over here? Can we do this? He very much thrives along groups of people. Wow. And if he, and he doesn't like to be without the groups of people. And so that's been an interesting thing for us. I see how it probably manifested as a baby. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love how you all, like you and him and Sahara are having this experience together. I'm sort of I'm moving my arms like a, like a mothering, nurturing, holding, like you're all re-experiencing that. She's not but. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, I it love is. that. I love that. That you I have mean, the chance to do that. It's amazing because one of the things I have noticed so deeply is that, and it could be because of what was happening in the womb. So I'm really into, this is part of the work I do is, is going back into the pre pre room and uh, really seeing I've, I've been able to trace back what happened to me. And that only happened actually when my, when my son was in the womb, I had some insight into some of my parts that I could not understand. And I was lucky that, I mean, when I was in, when, the, when Kanish was in utero, my father took me to dinner with my mother. And this was right before we knew she was, before she was going to get sick. We didn't know she was already sick. We didn't know. Mm-hmm. And they, he revealed to me at this dinner at my, their anniversary that I had been that he, and it was this beautiful thing. He was trying to tell me that he and my mother had gotten pregnant before they got married with me. 
And my mother was really young. My mother was 17 when she got pregnant with me. And he was trying to tell me because my mother had tried to like not like hide it. I mean, I was 42. I didn't know. So, so, and, but the, the important part of this is my mother, it was like, my dad was like, this is the best day of my life. Your mother called me. I was in New Mexico and I was like, let's get married. Like you're the woman in my dreams. I want to have this baby. He's like, that was the best day of my life. It was really the worst day of my mother's life. And it became clear that day that he told me in front of her without asking for permission mm. because she, um, it was horrible for her and she cried and she screamed and she said that we were never to talk about it again. And that she had such deep shame and she still did. She was 60 yeah. and she couldn't talk about it. And she forbade me or my dad or my partner who was there to talk about it to anybody ever again while she was alive. Um, but it was important because I have dealt with this deep shame that I have never been able to white like I was Catholic so it came from Catholicism for sure but it seemed to come before that uh, and it it definitely definitely probably I brought some men as a legacy but also I brought some in from that womb that whole caring never wanting to be my mother never wanted to do that that was never what she wanted and she carried deep shame because she was a deeply committed Catholic and um, anyway sorry I'm coming into this, this is oh, thank you are you feeling okay sharing this well I'm I, I, you know, this is so funny. I, it was really hard for me to say yes to this interview. Part of it is because, and the reason I did is because Duran and I, I love Duran <laughs> and Duran, she's like, you have to do this. And I was going around and around about a lot of the things that Duran wants me to share about are things that I don't share about outside of trainings or whatever, because my family's, my father's still alive. And my sisters, it's really my father and my sister. I don't care about anything. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but they're not going to hear this. <laughs> Was that how you let your parts let you do it? It's like, okay, dad and sister won't hear it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want my sister actually can hear it. Okay. My dad. It's my okay. dad. And I'm going to tell him. But I, I went round and round about this, like, because there's so much in here, like about what, what all, all the truths and all the things that I've become. I, I haven't written, I've wanted to write about it and do a lot of work about it. I've done some performance work. I do performance artist work, which, and my, and my dad has been privy to a lot of my mother and father were allowed into it, but I have avoided the topic of my raising in front of them and, and this kind of, um, and it's kind of just one of the big things I've like, okay, when am I going to be able to just speak freely about it? Yeah, um, yeah. But my father's, my father's really not. Yeah. My father's actually more, much more open than my father, my mother. So in, in, a, in general, he's not going to ask me to lie. He's not like that. I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. Good. How did you know that it was before you? Like, how did you have this, this shame? If you, is it okay if we talk about this a little bit? Oh, yeah. Because you just said so much. I'm like, we have to talk about this. I'm like, unpack <laughs> it. So um, how did you know that this feeling was not of you or before you? Well, I've been unpacking for a long time because there was a lot of shame, guilt, uh, deep unworthiness. Um, and the funny thing is I have a very interesting story because I, um, my parents who, uh, my, my mother is from Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Her mother was African, Portuguese, French, and her father was French, West Indian, East Indian. Um, there's a lot of different things in there. Okay. And really, really, really much. So half of my family, appears white skinned and half of my family is black. My grandmother was black, right? My mother's mother, but my mother was white skin appearing with green eyes, right? Wow. And so okay. was her sister, white skin with blue eyes, right? Wow. Okay. But my all the uh, brothers, so there's six of them all together. So all the brothers except for one is black are black, right? And what about the um, dad? What did the dad look he's like? White. He's white, okay. but obviously not, he, he, he is, he was white, but very 
his features were very potentially, you might consider them looking like an African-American. Interesting, even though he had fair skin. Okay. Um, because he definitely comes from a mixed family. Uh, but because he does. So his, his family is vast. They're on the island of Trinidad and Tobago, and they are all black, white, Chinese, uh, West Indian, East Indian. There's a, just a very large, um, but definitely on my grandmother's side, largely black. And a lot of them are in Jamaica. Um, they're, 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 they're a black, mostly black West Indian family. It's a really interesting uh, West Indian, there's a kind of almost a caste system there uh, in terms of that. You know, I remember my grandfather who was fairly racist. <laughs> so I, I can talk about him. That's my mother's father who, uh, he married a black woman, right? Has a half black children. Um, he was fairly racist. I remember from an early age him telling me, but in a caste kind of way. So I might call him a castist. <laughs> So he believed that there were, there were certain kinds of black people that were good, you know, oh. he had that very, okay. kind of like this idea of like this kind of thing. Okay. Um, and I think that was born of a certain kind of, you know, island oriented, you know, it's all, it's all, I, I don't really know. It's just what I remember. It's sort of the culture of that island with all of these different, mm -hmm. um, they were British there and, and, okay. and they were British and French colonized. And so okay. they all spoke the mother England, British tongue. Right. Wow. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they had, he had all these ideas, but it ended up being fairly racist. Did your grandmother or he or your mom ever talk about how the kids were treated differently, even though they're the same family, the ones that looked more white and the ones that looked more black? Inside of the family? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to know. I was so young. Uh, no, it, it, sorry. I never perceived it. One of the things inside the family, okay, because inside the family, this is more like what it was like. So in my family, and I remember my father being, because my father is amazing. It's, it's really interesting. I grew up thinking that I was born to two very liberal people. Okay. Because, and the more that I know about it, my mother was very liberal and, and very, and she had this idea of how she wanted to raise us. And she really convinced my father who comes from a very liberalish Texas family. I mean, they're not liberal, but loving, wonderful people who were, who were mixed as well, and, but not Mexican, Spanish, white, Native American. Okay. Well, I have and a book. And did they meet in, 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 in Texas? Like yeah, your mom? Met. Okay. So Texas. your mom appears to be white, but white-ish. And would she identify, how is she identify, would she identify, how is she, she identified? She would have identified. So this is really interesting. So this is the part that Duran really wants me to share. Is my parents told me, really my father, my mother didn't talk about it, that I was white. I grew up believing I was white on some weird, in some weird reality. <laughs> okay. Not really thinking that that's that important, but my parents right. were like, just sit, po check white. We're all white. Your our whole family's white. Your mother's family's white. Your, your grandmother's white. Gotcha. Right? gotcha. We're all white. Right, right. And, and his, my father's family was a mix, right? But they definitely were accepted as a white family. Right. Yeah. Even though my grandmother was was Mexican and Native American, and um, Spanish, and his father was had to, had it too. But they, it's my grandmother was adopted into a white family at birth. Um, my great on my father's side, and okay. she came from a mixed family, Mexican, Native American, white. And then her, my grandfather, his mother was definitely Mexican and Native American, but he she married a white man, and they all became white. And this is very common in yeah. the culture at the time. And my, I remember my father really letting me know that it's really important that we identify this way and that's who we are. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Gotcha. Um, and this is kind of a protection of the yeah. family. Yeah. And it's true because there was this inclination that white is protected, white yeah. is safe, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're all into this together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. and so everybody's so there wasn't a no we didn't have the in group the dark people got treated no not like that there was a definite like no we're a gang <laughs> and not we're loyal, loyal together we're loyal there's... together we stick together and yeah. we this is what we this is how we show everybody that we're together and we're safe yeah. and in a lot of ways that worked in some ways how did it uh, not work yeah well so it worked in some ways for my uncles because they were so talented they were very some of the biggest football stars they were they were they were extremely talented with sports and we were in texas right so they won some they were running they were winning the medals for the track team they were winning those football turn the state tournament they mm. were like star athletes mm. okay and so they got some special that really does buy you a lot in texas right yeah it's yes special. right special yeah special right um right you're so a football that, star in texas i mean yeah mm -hmm. privilege yeah. talk about privilege, <laughs> privilege of sorts. Yeah. Right. um but uh it didn't work for us in the sense that they did get treated different and they definitely got selected out by the police um and they oftentimes they were put in the hands of white coaches that treated them really badly. My grandfather allowed it. And, you know, I, I don't, I can't tell you everything, but I do know that oftentimes they were, you know, abused by, by people of authority mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and it was acceptable. At, and, and, you know, given that in Texas though, a lot of people were abused by people of authority. It was acceptable as a children. So that wasn't necessarily just uh, about their skin. But um, there was definitely racism in the town and they were accepted because they were athletes, but nobody really wanted them to date their daughters. Right. 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 So do you know this from your, like your uncles talk about this? Does your grandmother talk about this? Like how there. do you, yeah. I'm okay. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I was there. I mean, I, I saw them get in trouble. I saw yeah, I know all about the coaches. I, I, I mean, my, well, my mother were you, was your mom the oldest? My mother was the oldest girl. Okay, right, because I'm like you were there, right? Because your mom had you at 17, so you. So were I like, was the oldest. I was the oldest. So yeah. I was yeah. So I was only 17 years old with my mother. So all my uncles and stuff, like they were, I was with them. I was there. I was the oldest. So how do I know this? Because I was there. I was yeah. like them telling me stories. Yeah. I was well, that's what just dawned on me that you were there because your mom had you when she was so young. Yeah. yeah. So by the time like she was 17, so her brothers were younger. Yeah. So they're not that much older than me. Her brothers were maybe 10 years older than me. Okay. 10, 12 okay. years older than me, maybe. They were gotcha. my babysitters. Uh, yeah, they were like your brothers. Oh, yeah. And her family was my, you know, my parents were young. So you know who raised me? <laughs> my grandparents. Yeah. Her parents, mostly. Yeah. actually so I was there that's why I and I lived in that town my whole life so I experienced tons of it myself I experienced racism so I want to ask like how did you experience racism but I, I guess I want to go back to um I guess I let, let's go let's go with that let's I want to hear how you experienced racism as like growing up white and I'm putting that in quote quotations then yeah right so you know as I got a little bit older, I mean, I, I was lucky that I was a super, I was born empathic. I was born the fixer in the family. Mm -hmm. I was born called the fixer. I was born for some reason into this family that where I was, I knew early on that I was, and it might be that my parents were so young um, and they really wanted me to be, to have all that liberal ideology they wanted me to you know my mother so i thought they were super liberal i like they were attachment parents like i'm literally i like lived in a household where you know there was co-sleeping and there were no rules it was very like everything very almost a communal quality to my house um no you know no punishments uh and 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 they i grew up believing everybody was equal and that we were fighting for everybody's rights and there was this whole thing and, but what i didn't realize is i was like fighting for my own rights mm. <laughs> and because they had me like in this interesting world where i was white right but i really wasn't and as i grew older i began to realize that mm. um and so 
but I also began to realize that I really was different and that, and that like, I was considered exotic in that town. Okay. And I even had fathers. So I remember one of the times that I really began to understand this is one of my good friends who I loved dearly. I would go spend the night with, Mm -hmm. and I was still young and fairly naive. And I mean, yeah. still growing and uh, us getting in trouble for something. And I, you know, I don't really remember what it was. Maybe we snuck out of the house or we did something and um, we get, they, they find us. Right. And they, and they bring us back in the house and we're there. And he starts a lecture about me to his daughter and in front of me and to me. And it's the first time we really understood a little bit. I mean, I understood already a little bit, but he was telling her how I was dangerous and I was exotic and that I wasn't like her and that I was, I would cause a lot of trouble because I was, he was basically saying that I was potentially loose and that I was a sexualized person. I was, and that I needed to watch out and that, that, that she, and that, you know, that, that this is the kind of trouble, a kind of person like me would get into. Wow. Right. I remember this talk. Um, it was really hard because I had known these people for a really long time and I trusted these, this family. And I remember when he, t- when he was talking and he was saying this stuff about me, I realized it had to do with the fact that I wasn't white and that I looked different and that it was feelings he had toward me. I realized this right away. And that, that it was like a beginning of something for me, like realizing that I was, what was happening for things were, it was make, it made other things make sense. Like the fact that like, this was a very common thing. Like a boy wants to date, wants to, how like what was common for me in that town was nobody really wants to go out with me or be with me, but they were interested in me. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then at some point you realized why, or did you, or you knew why? Oh, oh okay. I realized why. Sometimes I was told wow. directly and sometimes people pushed. There was a lot of, so, you know, I grew up, it's, it's a culture. There's a rape culture there for every woman. Like, it's not like, you know, there's a rape culture in the South, in Texas. And uh, it might have gotten better now. I wouldn't know. I've been gone so long and I don't, I haven't really, but I, I don't know. It probably has gotten a little better. But when I was in high school, I knew women, my friends, you know, were, who were raped by people there at school with me that, that, you know, it was. And it was allowed or accepted or that's just what happened or it was their fault. Yeah. She was dressed in this way and he's a football player or whatever. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. So that's like, I, I have a really good friend that, um, I, I saw people that were taken raped by their friends, by their boyfriend's best friend. And then were broken up with by their boyfriend, right? This was very common, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I experienced a lot of people be really hurt. Yeah, yeah. And so um, that was the cult, there was a lot of that in the culture that I grew up in. And so I really struggled to stay away from that, right? Cause I was very smart about this kind of stuff, but also oftentimes was put in situations and specifically because I was a certain kind of person, right? That, that I, um, that you couldn't date, but, but you wanted potentially. So, um, yeah, I experienced a lot. I experienced some abuse and, um, and, and began to see it, maybe told by people, uh, just experience it straightforward, be things be said, you know, I remember my first prom date, like, the reason I remember this person asked me to prom and I realized that his, he said his father 
wanted him to ask me because she, they were friends of my mother's family. And I realized it wasn't because he liked me or, but it was almost like, it was just a favor. How did you not, in, well, maybe you did. Mm -hmm. I guess I want to say, how did you not internalize I'm less than? You know what? I was really this is interesting. So a lot of this stuff I, I realized not then, but after. Mm. And so, and so I had a really strong sense of self. My parents were freaking strong and they really instilled in me a sense of entitlement. So I have this weird, this is an interesting thing. I have this weird, it's a, this is a reality and this is a reality too. Yeah. So, so the reality ahead. is I'm being treated less than, and then the other reality is I'm entitled and I'm strong and I can do what I get, what I want, do what I want, say, Oh, I don't know what that is. That what sort of what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I had these both things. Yeah. And so at the time I didn't internalize it like that. I, I did fight hard. So one of the things I'm real, I've realized now is that the sexuality thing was hard, a hard piece for me. I was really quiet about it. That part, I didn't feel like I could ever talk to my parents about okay, that part. Yeah. They didn't give me. They yeah. Didn't. Because how much of that is, is a teenage girl is like, oh, the boys, the boys will date my friends, but they only want to like hook up, which we didn't use that term back then, but they use that right. now. Right. Like they just want to hook up with me. And so that, that is a girl. And probably as a guy too, I have no idea, but as a girl, I feel like there's something wrong with me. Why, why don't you want to date me? So I did actually internalize that. Okay. Not as a racial though, at the time, just that there's something wrong with me. So I did internalize that. I internalized that for a long time. I'm ugly. I'm fat. I'm, that became actually my issue for the first next 10 years. So a lot of the work I did uh, emotionally, psychologically, and in my art was all about media, body image, and our archetype, our roles as women. So, and my feminism. So that was the first inroad that I made. Uh, that was probably from, you know, like 16 to 25. That was all I wrote about. That's what I performed. That was my work. Um, and I really did a lot of work there. You know, it, it culminated in me when I, when I got out of high school and I went into college and I, I went into my first business because that's my traditionally I'm a business person that, from 17 and I was a performance artist and I would I was really pushing myself to to unburden these ideas and I really wow. at the time was focused on that and not on the race card because I didn't I mean I understood the race card but I still hadn't completely understood yeah. it took me a long time because i dealt with the catholic card and the fat and the and the and the, and the, the, the girl card yeah. first because yeah. i really thought those were my two biggest burdens to unburden yeah the race card came a little later for me yeah. because it's still i'm still unpacking it I'll i wonder honest. if it needed to be like you needed to do those first like those little layers or something like you had to go oh, through those sure. layers to get um, can you tell me, I have so many questions for you. Um, can you tell me about your performance, performing art though? What is, tell me about that. Yeah. So, you know, I really have always been an artist, but I call it a shadow artist, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not like a good painter, right. Or anything like that. Um, but I have a, I have a, amazing visionary work and I write and I at the time I were so many things that seemed so out of my work comes out of realizing that the world is not what I thought it was I mean that's kind of how I feel like I unfolded with my parents my parents kind of sold me this bill of how the world was and it wasn't true though in some ways they did me a, did me a, a, a good one because it allowed me I was super my mind was all over the place. I was reading, by the time I was 16, I mean, I was reading Castaneda and, and, and Vonnegut. And I was, I was reading everything I could get my hands on. And I was like, I was on my, and I was, you know, I was a debater and I was a singer. Right. Mm -hmm. And I kept going, I want to do, I, I needed to make things out of this, but I never could. I was like, I don't think I'm just supposed to write mm -hmm. because I, 
and, and probably my strong point is this expression, right? Um, put me in front of groups of people, mm. right? And I'm a performer, yeah. right? And I, I'm a writer, but it's, I write for performance, mm. okay. right? Okay. And I do something in, that came out of me. So I, and I was trying to figure out how to, to do it. Cause I was like, I don't think it. I don't, and I'm not really wanting to do plays. That's not right. what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> There was something else. And so I started getting inspired by um, some of the performance artists of the time. Uh, and I, I would, I joined an art collective when I was young and I, when I went into the coffee shop business because I only because I love coffee because it's one of my dearest loves, but also because um, coffee and juice bar, because I could perform there and I could do whatever I wanted. It could be a free speech zone. That's really why I did it. So I opened my first coffee shop uh, right out of high, right out of college, right in college. I was in college and I opened and so that I could perform. <laughs> and I also had an art collective down the road from my coffee shop that I was a member of. And so all we did was I started trying to figure out how to make art from this perspective. And I also studied, um, what do you call it? Performance arts therapy. And, and, and. Is that what you went to school for? No, 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 no. Just okay. workshops. Just going to to no psychology. Okay, but but I right, so you have a business and you're going oh, to yeah. school. Okay, oh, okay. This is me. <laughs> okay, and, and I'm going to these performance art therapies workshops yeah. where I made a bunch of breakthroughs. There, there's a lot here, and in the process of this, I lost my first husband. He died, which is what started me. He, he yeah, he in an accident when I was. Oh 21 and he, this started me on the line of the performance art therapy because I was having such a hard time with it and so somebody introduced me to these I don't even these workshops that were happening and sent me there and um that worked to work through your grief like to help you with your grief and they thought they thought it would help and so that's yeah. when I discovered that and I was like oh I love this mm -hmm. so then I took that and I started to take that kind of performance artwork therapy work and put it on stage Wow. And take that and then ask other types of artists to work with me. So we would create these multimedia performances based around some of these performance art techniques that I really loved. So we really try to help people work out process on stage, these certain things while there's like artists painting and then there'll be people performing and then we would have these interactive experiences with the audience as well. So my whole point was to kind of break the barrier between the audience and the people to bring in the psychological, emotional processing component that was really intimate mm -hmm. and also get the artists to really bring in their own personal life into this, mm -hmm. which was hard. A lot of them were like painters or actors who had never been asked to do all of it. That was my thing. So the first piece I did was called the veiled cage mother myth object yeah? yeah and it was all about there was an art show all about this the veiled cage mm -hmm. and can you tell me what that what that means so at the time when it was really about and i still feel it's a super strong issue in texas and i felt like it was really important is that i felt like especially in the south but all over the world we live in a veiled cage right so um, it's really about us and how we're allowed to be certain things, right? Especially where I grew up. And so mother was sacred. You could be a mother. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and you could be an object. That was super something that we, right. Yeah. And, and the myth part was the maiden, but myth was kind of like, the, the rest of it, like we were allowed to be a mother, we were allowed to be an object. And the myth part was we were allowed to be the myth. And that myth was the maiden, the, we were allowed to be the, and we were the scary thing, right? We have all this myth around us, mm -hmm. but all of it's inside of a cage, you know, and it's covered up, right? And it was just it, yeah. all about this cage that we live in and that we live underneath all of these things that certain things are acceptable and mostly anything outside of that wasn't. And that's what I learned. And our real, our real body, our real self wasn't, isn't allowed or, 
you know, the part of us that's not perfect or the part of us that's dirty or bleeding or, or, or the part of us that's none of that. Like we're not allowed not to be a mother. We're not allowed not to be in relationship. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, we're not yeah. allowed. You know, if you're not in relationship, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Right. If, if you're, if you don't care about how people perceive your body or you don't take care of yourself, what's wrong with you? Yeah. What if you just don't want to? Yeah. What if you just want to be a gr- dirty, like, like, what if that's not who, but we don't, what's wrong with her? She doesn't yeah. care. About herself, right. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. If you don't want to have babies, why? Why wouldn't you want to have babies? Right. So this is kind of, and in, in the South, it's so pervasive. Like it's so hardcore. And um, I was like, let's do a show where we just like spin this and we really get people involved. Yeah. Right. So the premise of the show, sorry, we're going off on this, but the premise of the show, do you really want to hear? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the premise of the show that I had artists, only women, do sh- work about that was inspired by this work, by my title, by my un- understanding. Then I got all these actresses who usually get a script, right? They come and workshop with me for months. And we do some of this performance artwork and and it was all based around this one woman, one little young girl who um, was pregnant and she didn't have anybody and she'd been shamed, been kicked out and she was wanting to kill herself. And it wasn't all around just the pregnancy. It was around all of these things. Like she wasn't beautiful enough. She didn't do this. She didn't have this. There's a whole thing. And she, and so they were all supposed to be a character that meets her in this in-between time before she makes a decision to kill herself. And they were different archetypes that were supposed to come meet her. So she could meet all the possibilities and, and be mothered and have these experience on stage to, to get some of the stuff that she's never gotten. So we, I put them in these situations where they had to workshop their own stuff. And then they actually picked who what made sense for them and so they helped create it around this character that I that I that I created based on their own personal journey with this themselves and so and this ended up being aspects of her her name was Rose and and there each of them was an aspect of her of woman of all the possibilities like the crone comes the mother just the mother that she never had the sister that there was a lesbian sister that came I mean there was all these different archetypes that came to talk to her and they would hold her and they would do this processing work right on stage meanwhile the audience is being asked to do things they have things underneath their chair I have planted people in the audience to do things to trigger them to see how they will react how they'll support because they have the opportunity to support her in this process but they also have the opportunity to hand her the gun wow because they have the gun in the audience (laughs) wow and so and so and meanwhile there's also this multimedia piece where i'm naked (laughs) which is like a kicker that's going on beneath and it's all about me being raw naked and imperfect and all the images that we get and so my parents are there, which is great. And, and, um, uh, and so there's all this stuff going on. And, and, um, and at the end, every time I do the piece, something different can happen. The outcome can be different, but the audience doesn't know that they just know that they're asked to do things or they have opportunities and they're being egged on by an actor that's in the crowd. And there's all these things going on and will they choose to give her the gun? And they do every time. No, and, what? Oh, they do because they don't believe they have a choice. And this is was the whole purpose of this is that how little we take responsibility and we think that because somebody tells us to do something or they're asked to do something that we're just supposed to do it. Like that's the thing. And it's it's every time somebody gives her the gun, right? And so that was weird. I didn't know that they would every time. This is kind of like a experiment. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, 
anyway, sorry. This is this no. Well, what I'm what I'm hearing is that idea of the parts of us that believed, it, depending on our culture and how we're raised, and what you know where where we are raised, we be, we have parts that will believe this is all I can be. I can. I hate to say this, just be a mom, or I could just be a secretary, or I could just be a sexual object, or I can just be candy, eye candy, or I can just be the smart girl that's a nerd and has no boyfriends or whatever that is. For women, it's sort of these are, they're parts of us that believe, that could potentially believe that. Is that right? Okay. They could believe that. And we have, we have a culture that will support that. That will support that. Uh, we actually have women that I feel, especially in the South, and I don't want to, because you know what? I know some of the strongest women in the South ever. So let me tell you, there are some strong women yeah. and they're amazing, but they still listen to their husbands. Yeah. They do. So many women are doing what their husbands allow, say, or feel. Yeah. And, and so this is a thing that I had come up against a lot when, and I, um, this is really about, we have a choice, but we also have to decide that we actually get to choose and that, you know, that they don't choose. Right. I wonder if how many parts of us don't, like you're saying, don't realize that we even have a choice. Oh yeah, we don't. Yeah, that's true. There's parts that don't realize. So I mean, from a parts perspective, yeah, we don't realize we have a choice. A lot of us, a part won't let us. Sometimes, you know, I work people all the time that don't even realize a part exists. Yeah. yeah right? Right. I mean, right, like right. so much so that they could continue a pattern in their life so deeply and they don't even aren't aware that they're, they have a part that's doing this. Yeah. So yeah, you're 100% yeah. right. I mean, this is historical. Yeah. You could consider that, uh, you know, when we look at historical trauma for, um, and like the per people of color community and in the Jewish community and different communities that have long histories of trauma. Imagine the historical trauma for women too. Well, and I wonder how much, how that becomes complicated when you're biracial. Well, then it's like how you, like, are there, and I wonder if that's part of the shame is that there's the choice is that I present myself as white and then I have to hide you know, my culture and my family and I have to hide all of that to be accepted or. Right. So when this is, this is how it plays out for me at first, there was no, I just, you, you first just like, it's an unfolding of realizing that you're, this is happening. Right. Yeah. So then you try to go reclaim your culture, but then you're, what is that? How do you reclaim a culture that was never taught to you by the people in your family in the only culture I did get West Indian culture. So that's the closest. I do have some West Indian culture for sure. That was given to me, but that is different, right? It's mm. not, it's West Indian culture. But I mean, my great, my grandmother, my great grandmother was half Blackfoot Indian, right? Like that's my father's grandmother, right? I have no connection to that. They wipe, they way wipe that out. Like there's nothing, right? Wow. And so- and my grandma, I mean, nobody talked to me about this. I don't have any, any connection to it at all, except for now I know. And so, um, so there isn't sort of a reintroducing or being loyal to the culture because you're like, we've been trying to be white for all completely understandable reasons for safety and survival. And so what is this? There is, what is the I, culture then? Well, and so for me, what it is, is that I'm constantly trying to reconnect to everything that I am. And, but I always feel like I'm not, that I'm faking it. So oh, okay. I, I have a hard time with this. I live in the in-between. Yeah. I am not white. Though I've been acculturated because what is white? I mean, what yeah. is white? White isn't even a cult. White isn't even, this is the thing is I work with us so much. So I've been, we've been sold a bill of goods that white actually means something, right? White is just a, is a, is a total misunderstood. It's like, what is white? Nothing. It's like, I'm pink. Right. Right. So yeah. now it's become a consciousness though. And it's a stomach thing. Right. So I understand it. Right. Because 
I've had to be in it and on the outside and on the inside and the outside and inside. So now I'm, no, I'm not. And I'm this, but I don't really belong to that either because they asked me, like, I'm like, well, I don't, you know, I feel what happens oftentimes when you are in that middle ground is that you don't belong anywhere. And I'm okay with that. What that really means for me is that I'm just reconnecting to all of my ancestral lines and really being able to uh, do embodied practices that feel and that are connected to my roots and finding those spaces where I get to be an activist. I get to, it's nice because I can, in some ways, in some weird way, I can work on these both sides of these issues. Yeah. Um, sometimes I put things out saying, Hey, I'm willing to sit with you as an ally. And oftentimes though, interestingly, I get people of color who want to sit with me as an ally, but oftentimes what I mean is not people of color, uh, only because I have a unique perspective, but I, I mean, I want to be both, but sometimes I feel not good enough to sit with people of color. It's not. So I feel like, wow, am I good enough? Am I well, is there, you know, can I sit with this trauma with you? Do I have trauma? Yes. I can, you know, I'm not even getting into all the times that I've been t- pulled up or by police. And like, there's been lots of trauma for me too, but it's not this, I don't feel like I got to be. And so sometimes I feel like I'm not good enough to do that. Now, oftentimes I do, I do it anyways. And, and, and I've had these amazing experiences and I have clients, you know, that, that are, it's the right thing. It's not the wrong thing, but I have to deal with this part. Right. Uh, right. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. The only thing you could maybe do is help be an ally to white people and help wake them up a little bit right, and, right. in a way that it doesn't feel confronting or um, wounding. Right, right. 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 So this part says that you haven't had it bad enough or you've gotten it, you've gotten off easy or something because you can pass for white or something. Right. Like that. And I've had some racism because I've had internalized racism, right? Yeah. I've had the whole even passing as white, even though I, I never tried to pass as white. Like I was never, I'm a white. It was never like that. Right. It was more like just the checking of the box and the not talking about it and the like right. being underneath what's going on. I'm always confused really more. <laughs> it wasn't um, me being white. That wasn't it. Well, I wonder if that's part of why your embodied practice was just such, so important for you. And like, even as a kid was cause that's what was true. Whether you're white, whatever, whatever you are, you're like, I know what my body is. And so that embodied practice. Yeah. You're shaking your head. Yes. Like- yeah champion for people. So I was an activist. So I've always been like in the midst of all that, I'm leading these giant marches. Like I, I led the biggest march in my town for, uh, against the, Af- when we were going to the Afghani war and, and like, I was at the front with my mother, you know, like I was having all these free speech spaces for LGBT community. And I was, we were just challenging, challenging, challenging everything. Um, and I was there, right? I was never afraid to challenge any of this. And I was never afraid. I was never afraid of any. It's the, it's the interesting part of this. I definitely grew up feeling like I could challenge anybody and that nothing was going to happen to me. Partially, I think, is because my parents lived in a state of privilege. Yeah. And so, so I was just like. I have hmm. two questions before we wrap up. Uh-huh. Um, and then I want, I want to check in and see if there's anything you anything else you want to say, because we didn't cover we did it. Half we did to cover. <laughs> well, yeah. One of them is so you're so all so this is the context and this is who you are when you go. I'm going to bring us all the way back to the beginning. When you mm-hmm. sit down with your mom and your dad and your dad says, you know, it's so it's that was such a beautiful moment. My dad started the story. We didn't know where it was going. And he was basically telling us the story that he had gone out of town. My mother was in high school and she got a phone call in New Mexico, telling him she's pregnant. They weren't married. They were just, which okay. was a big thing. My mother was Catholic. Right. And, she, and she in was Texas. Catholic. And it was so many years ago that this wasn't the norm. Okay. So this, this was a story that you didn't know. I was 40 something years old. And I was pregnant. He was telling it to me because I was pregnant. 
pregnant and I was married to my partner. As a matter of fact, I was still in a divorce from my ex, from my husband, who, I mean, we were separated for a long, long time, but we hadn't gotten divorced yet. Gotcha, and gotcha. So, so he was telling me this because he wanted us to know that it was okay. And that wow. this is the best thing that ever happened to him. And he was knowing this was going to be the best thing that ever happened to us. Wow. Wow. My mother, on the other hand. Yeah. The yeah. deep shame. So, okay. So that's part of that legacy burden was the shame of, the shame. of mom. And the so the story was that they were just in love and had you and yay, we have a new baby. Like that's sort of what you believed your whole life. Oh yeah. They were, they were married and, and that they, they were, had, and that was their first baby. And they just thought you were the best thing in the world. What I didn't realize is my mother really, really went out of her way to like change dates and to really make it look that way. Wow. And nobody ever told. Wow. My mom had me when she was 16 and I've been told my whole life very clearly how challenging it was and and in how I saved her in so many ways right but it's um but it's, so it's so interesting to me when people haven't been told the story because the story was such a part of my life That's amazing. well yeah it's interesting I mean I'm, I don't even know what it would be like to have that what I and so have have you noticed any anything have you had any burdens from that that you can think of that have you like had to prove yourself? Is there anything that's come out of that? I'm just interesting. I'm really good. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good question. I think that, um, well, what's coming, what, that's such a good question. And I think that I'll just have to sit with it. What comes yeah. up a lot is the, is that I, that the story wasn't ever about me. It was about my mom and how much of my feelings are hers and not mine that that's what it is. It's sort of my birth story is her story and not my story. So mm -hmm. what is my story? And can I have my own story? And can there be space for me? Mm -hmm. That's not her. I mean, it's, I don't live by her and it's sort of, it's, but it's, it. you get it. Yeah. So I think that's the, been the huge, like so much of my work has been on that about how much of my parts have taken on her feelings and yeah. Mm -hmm. Where's me? Where's, um, where are you on all this? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Thanks for asking oh. that though. Well, it's important. It's interesting. It's, I love this stuff. I mean, the, for, for some reason, this is becoming definitely a part of like what happened in the womb. Cause I'm finding so often when I'm working with people that it comes back to there. So, I mean, I'm over and over and over again. Well, that's the other thing I wanted to I wanted to bring you back to because I think that was what why why I was so interested in that in that just because it's such a good story, but also because like wow, you know I was in the womb, and there's there's other things about that. Um, I was my family was also raised Catholic, and um, other things that happened that I my mom probably wouldn't want me to share, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wonder like what the womb experience was like for me you know, being in this 16 year old's womb. And yeah, I wonder about that. Yeah. It's really, I think it's really important because I've learned so much about mine, what, how some of the things that's happened to me and I've been able to go back, I've been able to regress myself, but I've also been able to regress other people. And so that's been interesting because I seem to get a hit because wow. when I'm working with somebody on something that seems to be before, and so I'm like, okay, let's, let's go. And so what I found over and over again is that, and I just had this happen that if you go back and you look, and then you ask the questions of the mother, if you can, oftentimes you find the answer. That's so great. I've had That's that, great. I've had that with people re, just one recently where like she had the answer. Wow. She knew. Well that's, well, that's what we say, right? If we're doing, if we're back and we're self is witnessing, self is witnessing, we ask and the answers will be there. Even if we didn't know, like, even if I don't have a memory of that, we could ask the other people involved. Other people and they know. So, yeah. uh, and so when I work with pregnant women and myself, I was very clear because I felt like I gave my son some things accidentally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I experienced him in that a lot but I didn't with my second daughter I have a, I had a very like this is mine and this is yours the whole nine months and then I did a lot of visual 
visualization and meditation with other women because I was, my intention was she would not carry any burdens upon arrival. And I do believe she's not carrying any burdens on arrival. And part of that was all this work I did around that, right? So one of the things I really am encouraging because I've worked with specifically one pregnant woman is that they're, they are everything, they know everything. So the moment you say, this is mine and this is yours, baby. None of this is yours every day. None of this is yours. You are clean, clear, and healthy. And this is what I offer you, right? Because imagine that they really are hearing and understanding everything that you're doing. Yeah. What a beautiful gift we can give our children. Yeah. That really touches me. I love yeah. that. Yeah. It's good talking to you. It's yeah. so good to it's talk not to what you. I wanted to talk to you about, but it's great. It's funny. It was on my mind. You can't talk about anything about your family. <laughs> oh, <laughs> My part was like, yes, you are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. yeah. Um, will you, let's just end with this. Where mm -hmm. are you in the world? Cause you're not in Texas anymore. Is that right? Oh no, no. I haven't been there for a long time. Yeah. Um, I am in Ashland, Oregon. Okay. Mm -hmm. How'd you end up there? We haven't even talked about my Okay. Life. What I, I, uh, you know, I quit my life before, before the kids came because I hadn't had any babies. I didn't really have my first baby till 42. So. Mm. Um, and um, I started doing transformational adventure journeys uh, at 39 with my part, current partner in Central America. And so we did that. So brought people to group work, to do these big, big rites passage pilgrimages for people in transition who need breakthrough, you know, and so I really kind of started just focusing on my work there. And then that process got pregnant. And um, when we decided to stop doing the journeys, when we were re-entering America, we uh, were looking for a place with the Waldorf school that was accessible because I really believe in Waldorf education. And that was in the Northwest because I was living in Washington before I left. And that was liberal and that had, the, had all the things. And Ashland is unique in that aspect accessible Waldorf education it's in the northwest it's liberal it's small it's all those things and uh and so it was just it, it's ended up being perfect for our children it's that's really awesome. for our kids that we live here yeah that's yeah. awesome mm -hmm. um so is there anything else <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say or? No, I don't want to say anything. I'm good. I think okay. this is probably why we met. You know, I had to, yeah, I, there was a part of myself that was like, I'm never going to do this. And here I did it. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.